everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, so before we get started, I just want to tell you about some of our upcoming programs for the rest of the month of April. Tomorrow night, actually, we have the Piscataqua Rangers Junior Fife and Drum Corps coming. Uh, not the entire corps, because they said it would be a bit loud in the library, but we do have a number of them coming. And they're all under 18 years old. And on Friday, we have our Spring Bake Sale. Um, so if you're looking for some goodies to get through Easter weekend, definitely stop by and see us. And anything that remains from Friday will also be selling on Saturday. And then lastly, our last program for the month of April, on Wednesday, April 24th, we have Robert Ortiz joining us. And he is the photographer who's on display throughout the library this month. And he's going to be talking about his experiences in Cuba outside of the tourist area. And all of his um, photography that's on display right now is taken from Cuba. So that's what he'll be talking about. Um, but tonight we have Mark Sweetum joining us. And he'll be uh, telling us stories from the 20th century to the present. And they are When Autumn Comes, In the City of Angels, and Confession to a Grandchild. And he is here all the way from Hebron, Maine, where he lives with his llamas and a dog. And we all want to hear about the llamas. All <laughs> so right. you've got all to right. include that. <laughs> so uh. please welcome Mark Sweetum. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> As a young man, I considered the course of my life to be of my own choosing. But even in the womb, I traveled the empire's path. I think it unlikely, however, and I made some good friends along the way, but I think it unlikely, however, that one of these individuals and I ever became friends, and yet we are the closest. We were both born in the pause between the Korean conflict and the police action that would come to be known as the Vietnam War. It was 1955. We didn't really think about it until our senior year in high school, and the carnage continued. In 1973, if you volunteered, the Army would allow you to choose your duty station for the first two years or your MOS, your Military Occupational Specialty. Either option provided the potential to avoid the unspeakable horrors being perpetrated in the jungles of Southeast Asia. We graduated in June. He wanted to be a tanker. I chose to become a German linguist as a way to see Europe. In July of 1846, Henry David Thoreau, a famous New Englander, spent a night in jail, having decided that detention was preferable to paying taxes to a government waging a war of territorial aggression against Mexico, while Commodore John Drake Sloat, commanding the Pacific uh, Squadron, took possession of the Presidio at Monterey on the coast of California. It was August, 127 years later, when I arrived at that very garrison to attend class at the ironically named Defense Language Institute. Every language of friend or foe of any geopolitical importance was and is being taught there. Russian, Chinese, Arabic, German, of course. Very few servicemen and women at that time were being taught Vietnamese. It was quietly acknowledged in the ranks that this conflict would end soon enough and not in glory. Surprisingly, a significant number of soldiers were studying Spanish, all of them male, every one a member of special forces like the Green Beret or Navy SEALs. We all had top secret security clearances, so in hushed conversations with the benefit of booze and the barracks at night, you could hear stories from these hardened warriors of clandestine, emergent wars we were already fighting in the jungles of Central America, my prospects of avoiding armed conflict began to fade. The word Monterey is Spanish. It means king of the mountains. And so there were once innumerable mighty kings and priests in the regions about Monterey, but they suffered at the hands of men, an iron inquisition 
where in ages past they stood arm in arm covering every ridge and slope and valley. They were the swells of a great ocean, a sea that dwells on land rising and falling to the horizons. Every day they were first to greet the dawn and from that height the last to survey the sun retiring to his bath. Now these hills and promontories come prostrating themselves to the Pacific like meager monasteries where the rare and ragged remnants of a once magnificent race of redwoods cloister themselves, spreading their limbs and needles beleaguered and begging for alms of the morning fog, and where the land finally kneels at the cistern, seeking submersion in the holy waters, secluded sandy sanctuaries serve as the chalice for communion at sundown. Here, on a narrow strand, after removing my shoes, I would stand and learn prayers and a rosary of confessions and omens for Ozymandias from the high tide of a new moon washing my feet. Cold waters from beneath a setting sun, lush with the remains of innumerable creatures, each one encapsulating incandescent aliens from the shores of that distant flaming globe, eternal entities intent on inhabiting this world. Spirits become flesh, their vitality vitiated by every variety whose volume makes the sea voluptuous and teeming. Touching my toes, they tarry in that moment of stillness between the last tender caress of a mighty wave and it's falling back into the depths. Having welled up in the deep, driven by the wind from beyond horizons, becoming smooth, shallow, a nail on a fingertip, skimming silently up, expending the last, hanging motionless, weary, releasing tiny, infinitesimally tiny immigrants and receiving in return <coughs> exhausted expatriates to rest on a circumnavigation of discovery and revive their spirits in the sopero sediments of the abyss. A voyage beyond the imagination of the crew of the Beagle and every Britannia boasting of ruling the waves, dissolving grain by grain the prayer pressed like cuneiform into the tablet of sand beneath my feet. My friend's feet were washed as well, but his in the dry white sands of the relentlessly repeating dunes of Fort Bliss, New Mexico. Another possession confiscated in the victory over our neighbors to the south. There he learned the art of tank warfare but helicopters had become the cavalry of combative conflagrations consummated in the canopy of rainforest, and no one needed a German translator in Saigon. So we were both assigned to the 3rd Armored Division and stationed in West Germany, just this side of the Iron Curtain. Here, at this imaginary line on the face of the earth, the same two empires that were grinding the Vietnamese people into a bloody slurry in the mud of their own rice paddies stared each other down in the cold silence of mutually assured nuclear destruction. He was a tank commander. I gathered intelligence from East German radio transmissions and practiced electronic warfare. He's from New Mexico, his skin is brown, mine is white, and I'm from Texas. Both of us, descendants and collateral damage from a previous clash <coughs> of empires. We never met until we arrived separately in Maine. After my tour of duty, I trained and worked as a pipe fitter 
a few years later, I was unemployed, one of the walking wounded of the energy wars. I had always intended to go west, imagining myself the descendant of pioneers, having confusing courage with the conquest of frontiers. The prevailing winds, however, rise up in the setting sun and blow to the break of day. And so I was driven to the dawn to face the light. Let me return. I remember the very day I drove into Maine, September 18th, 1987. The traffic, the lack thereof, the quiet, and no hideous billboards screaming at my eyes, just trees, cool green trees whispering in the breeze the compassion of their good deeds. I'm from Houston, where the horizons are obliterated by absurdities plastered on signs as big as New England barns, but with none of their wisdom. My brother calls it a big work camp, and he's right. By the time you get a paycheck, you're so worn out you fall prey to the drugs being pushed on the crass quarter acre classified hooters, horsepower, housewives of Houston. Next thing you know, you're addicted and in hock to the company store, now appropriately called MasterCard. Everyone I loved dwelt there, but even they couldn't hold me any longer. I fled to the deserts out west, and some people love them, but no one really lives there. They live by the grace of trees from somewhere else. Trees in the mountains holding the snow in spring, something saved for the river in summer, and that too taken and dragged to a city, an obese imitation of oasis. Without trees, my horizons are horrible, and I am in danger of being swallowed up by diffusion, of being spread so thin I turn to vapor. This is why no one lives on Mars. Have you seen the pictures? Sure, the air is thin, but it's the trees. The trees. There are no trees for air to hold on to, and without trees, no one could look for long without longing, <coughs> and their longing would look for green. Therefore, let me return to my trees. I like living close enough to smell their breath so that when their exhalations leave them, I am the first to breathe their newborn breath before the cars and the wars I let my lungs linger in the presence of a wisdom worked out in eons past by beings possessed of a passion for peace. I like to stand among them and listen to the creakings and moanings, words in a long conversation with wind, a weary witness returning from a wanton world to her only refuge, pleading for purification. Why else would she howl? I like to think, if I wait long enough, I too will be cleansed, that the testimony of my eyes will be swept from my consciousness by the needles and leaves like phlegm from my consumptive lungs. So I stand and I breathe, but my breath comes short now, as if this greatest of all coursing with life, consoling the earth, collective, can barely catch its breath. And I wonder if the chronic, obstructive disease afflicting our race has finally infected them. I refer to them as my trees, but I do not own them. I Oh, it was 1519, the year 1519, 27 years 
a mere 27 years after Columbus crossed the Atlantic, that Hernán Cortés planted the flag of the Spanish Empire on the east coast of Mexico. Shortly thereafter, a series of devastating defeats and deceptive alliances resulted in the death and displacement of untold numbers of native peoples. Some who were able escaped to the sanctuary of the near impenetrable Sierra Madre in northwest Mexico. To this day, one or two tribes have managed to maintain their language and culture in spite of European domination. My friend's ancestors come from this region. When his enlistment was up and he returned stateside, he found work as a welder and a maintenance me mechanic in a copper smelter sitting atop the ulcerous open pit mines near his home in Lordsburg, New Mexico. But conflict clung to him as well. And before long, he found himself on the front lines in a war for wages where, like his ancestors, foot soldiers armed with sticks and stones squared off against forces beyond their comprehension. And as is the way with all local rebellions, poverty listed him and every one of his companions as missing in action. And soon enough, he found his way to Maine on the Empire's path, a path where no longer will neophytes be coddled in a catechism of cunning contentments, rather supplicants submerged in a system without the sacrament and solace of rebirth must prove themselves by endless exertions and hoarding confirms their worth. I call him chief. He's getting his knees replaced. When he walks, his shoulders sway from side to side as if the sockets of his joints no longer know when to stop. And he per perambulates like some painful pendulum to keep them from sliding off the edge. It hurts me to watch. He never complains. He's a Mexican, two parts Indian, one part conquistador. His name is Miguel, like the archangel. He was the firstborn, and you can see in his face the dignity his father gave him with that title and the weight of living up to it. Maybe that's what finally wore out his knees. We were young men when we went into the mill. In those days, he could outpace us all like some Tarahumara tribesman from Chihuahua. When we needed rest and water, he would stand and smoke a cigarette. But concrete and steel floors lack even the comforts of the stony Sierra Madre where his ancestors fled the Europeans. They finally caught up with him here in the mill where his broad shoulders and sure-footedness fit him for the harness of leadership whose straps are never fail and always surpass and every bundle bound is heavier than the last. He doesn't complain. He's Mexican, two parts Indian. But he too longs for a sanctuary in High Sierra where a Paso Alto lingering with snow in spring might refresh his steps, thin, cold air, cauterizing his lungs of corruption, the barren, withering heights forbidding both the comforts and curses of Cortez, a path that a man with his cartilage and ligaments, if but only briefly renewed, might ascend within breath of the remembrance inhabiting these unproductive, quiet places and breathe memories like sharp winds falling from the ridges to sever his soul from desire from, for El Dorado. In the mill, one may climb and climb and climb standing even on the pin <coughs> pinnacle of the powerhouse to see only as far as the parking lot. Vehicles that bring you again and again and again to a labor 
bringing you to your knees on the empire's path. And it hurts to watch. Thank you. If we're fortunate, we can find from that time of insatiable childhood curiosity a memory of the beautiful. And if we place that image adjacent to all the others, it will tell us some truth. When I was nine years old, my family lived for one year in Landstuhl, Germany. Now in terms of weather and terrain, this region is remarkably similar to Maine. The villages, however, are old. With winding streets of cobblestone placed one by one by workmen on their hands and knees in a time before bulldozers and excavators. The houses were built of blocks of clay and stone hollowed from the surrounding hills. And in the springtime, flower boxes overflowed from the windows and every plot was planted with a garden. The shops were small and simple and defined by skills that families had practiced for generations. Bakers for bread, cobblers, tailors, binders for books, millers and masons. The house next door was home to three generations of a family from a long line of farmers. Their small fields of wheat and alfalfa were plowed with a walk-behind tractor and planted within a foot of the edge of the road. The men reaped the harvest with scythes and hauled it to the mill on a horse-drawn wagon. And penetrating the forested hills vaulting up around the village were narrow paths. And this land was the commons. It was collectively owned by the village for hundreds of years. Deep in the woods, there was a house, the Waldmeister's house. His life's vocation was to tend to the health of the forest for the good of all. Along these paths, you would occasionally see neat stacks of cordwood precisely cut to one meter in length so that they would fit on little articulating uh, uh, wagon trains pulled by what looked like a, a primitive four-wheeler. And then the, the short remnants and the slash would be gathered up by the collier, Der Bergmann, the Germans called him, the mountain man. And he would take these and stack them in a circle with a hollow underneath and cover it with loam and moss and burn it slowly to create a big pile of charcoal. And many of the village people still use that fuel to heat their homes. <coughs> Let me find my place. <laughs> would use that to, find, to heat their homes. After the evening meal, you would often see couples and families quietly walking through these paths. For many of them, it was a daily ritual, and only the worst weather would warn them off. Ringing the perimeter and lining the paths and disseminated in the depths of the forest, there were centuries-old sentinels that stood to stifle the sound and the pogroms of progress threatening the nurseries of their infants and their adolescents. It was these elders, I think, who had long since surrendered to stoic stability and unwavering wisdom that gave the village its lasting vitality. My brothers and I would spend our days wandering and wondering in this accessible wilderness 
beyond our imagination. A year later, we received government housing and moved to Ramstein Air Base a few miles away. My father was too young to be involved in World War II, but he fought the whole of the Korean War from 1950 to 1953, as I said, and then he returned to marry my mother, and as I said, even in the womb. We were in Germany because my father was in the Air Force. He served in the Strategic Air Command, whose members were tasked with keeping the nation's nuclear arsenal at the ready. So we lived, usually, on military bases that housed fully armed B-52 bombers. Consequently, we were a prime target for the dreaded communist, and I was among the first to march in an orderly fashion into the hallway of the school with all the other children, sit on the floor, place my head between my knees, and contemplate beneath a blaring siren, warning of the impending mushroom cloud, like the one we had seen on newsreel clips filmed from above some unfortunate Pacific Atoll and the subsequent deadly fallout that would eat your flesh away. Everyone in my generation is insane. We were never meant to stand so close to a Big Bang. In the beginning, there probably was a Big Bang and many a smaller bang since. Even now, they continue in some distant sky. Our own benevolent flaming neighbor must roar with vitality. But I love the quiet and need a more moderate conversion of the awesome power. Birds at first light are able to translate what has traveled to us in silence. Their hearing unquestionably more acute than ours. I think too they must never have lost their fluency in the primal tongues which let them sing to one another of the first fruits of being alive. Their arias speak without a doubt of the abundance of just enough and they pray, it seems, a humble petition, give us this day. Foraging, fluffing, and preening, they praise and give thanks for a power that comes to them morsel by morsel, demonstrating a faith devoid of dogma but full of trust with frequent brief Sabbaths of rest and renewal. This life, I think, of simple devotions to harmony is their peace and salvation. Looking back, the bomb never was a cause, rather a symptom in a culture where more than enough is never enough and even our hereafter must be a city whose streets are paved with gold, it was inevitable. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, too big to fail capital consumerism and all our gadgets of distraction, anesthesia and placebos to hide us from the fallout of despair. Of late, I devote myself to simple harmonies, soil, trees, bicycles, llamas. I intend to bury the apocalypse in compost. I, re I relieve my children of the burden to be as I was. I ask only that when I lie down, you let me feel the earth, no gilded box or sepulcher sealed with stone. Sharing has now become my mirth. I have no desire to sleep alone. Make a bed of woodland mulch scented with needles and the cone, and may my quilt be twigs and leaves, both comforts of my cult. Then pile me high with whatever dust. Let the little ones have their lawn for they can cultivate the dusk, giving rise to my new dawn, where I welcome every bumbling bee and they imbibe in my cologne, 
while I peddle flowers with their seed to those whose power it is to roam. What was me, lust to breathe, what till now I must exhale, and the fabric of my crumbling sheath will spread wings on others that sail. No longer will I toil or spin, I, yet I glory more than kings of men. Every morning my face will seek the sun. When it rains, I'll soak my feet, travel farther than my legs could run. And though now parted, I am more complete. Do not chisel my days in stone. I become a choir, not a voice alone. Every cocoon incubates a birth. When I lie down, <coughs> let me feel the earth. Thank you. Now I learned all these things in Maine. Because when you live in a city, you learn what a city has to teach you. You're like that old song. You're a man of the city, concrete under your feet, living in a river of darkness, a man of the street. That's what they have, and that's what you learn. But when you come to Maine, and you start living in the woods, and if you pay attention, then you have some new, new things to set against all those other images, not just that one beautiful image you can remember. Let me share some of those with you, or some of the things that, that we're fighting. I tell my wife, because we, we live alone now, the kids are grown and gone, but we got the two dogs and we got the llamas and everything, and people always ask you, well, why do you have them? Can you eat them? Do you make any money off of them? And truthfully, at one time, you could make monies with, with llamas and alpacas because it was all hyped up. But, you know, they'd sell them for thousands and thousands of dollars. But really, they should have always been like sheep. They have beautiful fiber, and you can shear it, and you can sell it if we'd have kept a mill in Maine. But that mill went the way of all other businesses in Maine. You know, we can't have anything local. I'll get to that. That's another story. But we have them because they're beautiful, you know. But what's beautiful is our relationships. But this, this whole rush we're in nowadays, and it, it's, it, you're my age, you understand this. I love mature audiences, forgive me for calling you that, because you understand every word I say. I don't have to fill in the blanks, you know. Our whole life has been nothing but acceleration. Now that's crazy. On the face of it, it's insane. In any context, in an automobile, in an airplane, in business, constant acceleration, unlimited growth, you, you name it. You know, if you, I work in the medical industry now. You know what we call that? Cancer. You know, that's what it is. Unlimited growth. You can't get enough. You can't soak up enough resources and put it into reproduction. Boom, boom, boom. That's cancer, you know. I'm a medical coder. We have one beautiful maxim in that field. Code first, the underlying condition. There's all kinds of manifestations and symptoms and signs and things. But you know what we code first? For the payment, so that we know what the doctor's doing his job? Code first, the underlying condition. He's got cancer, you know. It doesn't matter how much cream we rub on his sores, you know. They're not going to go away. He has cancer. We have to treat that or they're dead, you know. Our society, everything's a blur of more and faster gigabytes and pixels posing as people. Persons once present and determined, now permitted and dismissed with the brush of a finger while every nuance of trivial pursuits of the narcissistic inundates us with mind-numbing regularity. <coughs> Me, I like your face. So close, there's no room to translate thoughts into digital text tapped out on tiny, annoying keyboards. So close, 
I can hear the fear of sadness hidden in your words, and you perceive the gravel in my voice, softened, seeking somehow to soothe. So close, I am able to apprehend hope rising in your response and resonating with my feeble faith, showering emotions like some welcome rain on parched earth, awakening seeds and spores laying dormant, waiting, waiting for a touch of tenderness to infiltrate them and swell them up and rupture their rinds so that they take root, sprout, and bloom. And what was sand, dry and silent, repeating like impassable dunes between us, become meadows of blossoms and swords of tall grass on the hills and dales, a place where our spirits run free together. Our eyes see the same green valley and breezes warm descend the slopes and lace the air with scents of nectar and provender. Our hearts clasp hands and we lean back and trust and twirl to the sound of a music that can only be heard in symphony. So close that even though gentle and gifted fingers should key some instant message, it can never fulfill the promise of your voice. Sweet with breath and every vowel on your lips, read as a pledge by my eyes confirming our consonants, I would rather wait, letting your absence punctuate and persist than seek solace and substitution so that when we meet again, my hunger is demanding and undiminished and only you will do. That I wrote because of my wife and for her. I think all this right, it has infiltrated right down to our romance. It's come right in the bedroom and say, we don't have time for each other. I'm against it. I sheared llamas for many years. I don't do it anymore because everybody sold their herds off because there's no money in it anymore. But I used to shear a hundred, a herd of a hundred llamas over in New Hampshire, uh, excuse me, Vermont. Drive from my house to Vermont, spend like three days there to shear a hundred llamas. Wonderful people, most beautiful llamas I've ever seen in my whole life. I would drive over there this time of year. Just the snow was melted because you want to get the fiber off them because they get hot really easily when the weather starts warming up. So I'm driving over there and the leaves haven't poked out on the maples and the, 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 the beaches and the oaks and stuff lit yet. But guess what you can see as you're driving along the road, you see it pure white off in the forest, not sometimes right up on the road, but usually in there a little ways, pure white blossoms on the old apple trees, you know. And, you know, you see all the old rock walls in Maine. This story is about that. Fruit, I call them, I call it rootstock. Fruit from the fields of a far off land, a shore so distant it watches the setting sun while mine sleeps in the night. But what of my wine? Vineyards planted and nurtured for generations now grown over with briar and bramble. The apples of my orchard fallen from favor in the fickle festival of the market. Their arthritic limbs swollen with the carbuncles of past prunings, but covered from head to toe with suckers, supple and limber with the tenderness of youth, the dreams of roots, yet imagining that their sap is sufficient, having been seduced by the sun beaming attention on buds believing beneath and before a forest of maple and beech begin to dapple with every green reach. But for now, these old maids dress themselves in bridal splendor, white gowns of delicate lace with veils and trains wafting in the wind, 
the breeze, a flower girl carpeting the ground with petals perfumed to entice her beloved, who dispatch winged groomsmen bearing cryptograms of love written in dust. To read them is to become heavy with child, to swell again with the promise of young maidens, to hope again for children and children's children, to cast sweetness on the earth, to watch those about you feed on your bounty, even though one's fruit is small and bitter by comparison. Yet these patrons partake without restraint, the birds, the, 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 the squirrels and all, they partake without restraint, eager for new wine, fresh with fermentation, cloudy with earthy sediment. They swill, their cup runneth over. Not a one of them, the cautious and capricious connoisseur, swirling, sipping, and spitting. They care nothing for vintage, feasting on the pulp and pomace, running through the reserve until there is none. Every vintner would be so honored. She glories in their intoxication, their, intem their intemperate love for her. And so, in the winter of her rings, vendors having long forgotten her varieties, her devotees acclaim her like Dionysus. She will go down to her rest sought after, while those from afar, forsaken and uprooted in their prime, by propaganda only to be replaced by some heralded hoopla make us yearn for the taste of our terroir, the sweetness of the soil on which we stand. Search in vain for rootstock disregarded and unremembered and lament what of my wine. I don't know how it is in this part. Up where I live, they have a research station for apple trees where they try to keep the old ones, lots of them, alive. Much like the bees are, are suffering genocide, it's happening to apple trees. There's probably a lot of reasons for that. My own personal quasi-scientific theory is, like everything else, we've gone too far, you know? We didn't know when to stop and leave it alone and let it be hardy and wild and smaller and a little more bitter. You know what I mean? Everything had to be super sugared and super sized, you know? That's my, that's my theory. Let me see what else I got here for you. How, how am I doing on my time? I have no idea. Fifteen minutes, okay. Then, I, then I, let me choose wisely here. I'll give you two, two short ones. And then if you want an encore, I'll give you one of those. <laughs> now, in Maine, I spend as much of my time as I can. I roam the woods, looking, listening for elders. So few remain, but I came upon a matriarch whispering her name, earth lifted up while wind descends. Earth lifted up while wind descends. I got it, sorry. <laughs> I don't normally do this. Earth lifted up while wind descends, fastened by fire where water winds. And when I lay my water loans, fire to others, some wind goes home, and I return to earth as loam. To hear her name is to enter a circle that spirals to the future and into the past, whose end is beginning and what was first is last. Her children stand tall about her diminished form, their arms raised up in praise of her passing, a, a passage where every layer releases some light, gathered in days of wondering height. Now she lay in the loam, and loam become 
moss for a mantle and hide from the sun, sun bound in a parchment, ring after ring, now nurturing those who cause others to sing. Their song is a feast, their dance is desire, and the festival continues by day and every face of the moon and voyage of the seasons. The scroll is unrolled, its substance divulged, decades of descendants and disciples debate and decipher an enduring enigma. Earth lifted up while wind descends, fastened by fire where water wins. And when I lay my water loans fire to others, some wind goes home and I return to earth as loam. That, of course, is the big nurse logs you find in the forest. You know, there's not that many left in Maine because we mow. And about 20 years later, we mow again, you know? So I worked in a paper mill for a long time up here. I learned everything I could about grinding living things up and making something else out of them that we were going to throw away, you know? I had to go to the woods to heal myself, you know. I know the paper mills have provided a lot of good work for a lot of people. I'm one of them. But we got to find a better way, you know. I hope we can find it. And probably one of the most important things that I learned in Maine, because in Houston you don't really have seasons. You have two seasons, okay. You have what they call cold. <coughs> 40, 50 degrees rainy, okay? That's winter. And then you have, and it's really humid then, and about half the days, even then, you turn the air conditioner on if it hits 70 because it's so sticky, you just got to dry the air out. And then the rest of the year, the air, the air conditioner just runs constantly in the house because it's so hot and humid. It's stifling and everything, you're surrounded by concrete on all sides. It's just stifling. When I came to Maine, I finally got to learn about seasons, although I learned a little bit when I lived in Germany as a child. But then I lived in Houston. I went back to Germany as a young man, as my story indicated. But this story, I learned the seasons. This is the last year of my mother's life. When autumn comes, let me get a drink first. When autumn comes, I go into the forest. I let them fall, all the old leaves of my life. My labors and thoughts having reached their height, I release them, pulling back the breath and sap. They dry up and drift to the ground where they lay at the mercy. The cold rain does not revive them, but rather makes them palatable to others who eviscerate and digest until I no longer recognize. Somehow, letting go gives me solace. My limbs feel lighter, unburdened. My sugar deserts me and hides into below, and I behold my unclothed nakedness. Branches having doused some invisible path, their bare and twisted forms tracing the possibilities of the past, reaching out from seemingly motionless trunks covered in hieroglyphs of scales and ridges, a language with no translation in the spoken tongue, but poured over again and again by scholars with wings and legs, mandible and claw, but they won't read again until the thaw. When winter comes, I go in, the faint sound of rustling at my feet, and that too quieted, by the downy white comforter laid on and about me, and I drift off to a rhythm of sleep. Icy winds blow beneath cloud gray skies, and I and the others like me howl in the gale. Stand, stand and receive. The tempest takes what he will. Bones are broken and some voices fall, never to be heard again except in a memory of their companions. Wounds that do not bleed and the cold numbs them. Some I have held too long. 
but I would not let them go. Here too the winter shows me a kindness for which I had no courage to ask. Covering the dead and severed members with a cloud of crystal, their imperfections soften, their forms now a sculpture glistening in the sun. And in that light, my own frailties find comfort. And this rhythm is slower still than the stillness before. When spring comes, I go in and stand in snow to my knees and wait in the fellowship of trees. Our eyes are asleep, but the arms are raised and we have our ears. So when melting ice becomes a minstrel and our hands join in the praise, our hearts are warmed by what we hear and soggy snow becomes a timbrel. And so begins the rhythm of mud a melody where there's neither firmness nor flood, and every creature must act on faith. Those who sleep must rise from their nap. Before the budding, commit sugar and sap, and so it rises again and again, and without the mud and slush, expire and expend. Believing begets, and because of the ones we have lost, light finds dormant buds and shadows frost, and every radiance, no matter how faint, is eagerly sought, a palette with which to paint. Leafing out, we open our eyes and draw our water, mixing mud and light. The ground beneath us is firmed and the fresco formed is us, but not as we remember. The detritus of my losses lay all about, but it no longer sorrows me. I draw strength from what they were, and without the shadows they cast, I see more clearly and beyond the past. My failures before where I could only not, I now branch out without a withering thought, and every new thought becomes a blossom, whose aroma is ambrosia and the nectar is wine, pollen is food and fertility, and I receive theirs, and they receive mine. The scholars return to the study of my parchment. Corns and calluses removed, wounds are dressed, and the fragments of trauma trimmed and taken to furnish someone's burrow or nest. We all inhale, <coughs> stretch our bodies and limbs, and exhale moist and vaporous breath, and gentle rains return, a reward for faith expressed. We swell with promise and promiscuity, pursuing every possibility, notion, and niche, and being saved from loneliness and sterility, we embrace and caress the earth. When summer comes, I go in and marinate in the balmy musk and myrrh, the diaspora of the deceased, mingled with the fragrant fecundity of their descendants. Slow days are saturated. The very shade is sticky with the waiting of gestation. Nights, however, are for gathering, where every canopy of lily and fern, pond or vernal pool, with boughs above framing starlight and moon, become the Odeon where every participant is like Linus and Orpheus, a descendant of Calliope, each reciting an odyssey of journeys embraced and endured with ballads of triumphs and beast, love unrequited or won, and finally reunion with friends and familial feast. The cacophony conceals the order they keep, but symphony of truth is performed and they're coming. The peeps, having labored through this languid rhythm, I revive with the slightest coolness of breeze, a leaf here and there, semaphores in yellow or red, and every fruit fulfilling its fate for which it was bred, leaves its mother and returns to the earth. The placentas become plenty for all the rest, but children go on, and they too will give birth. And all the old leaves of my labors and thoughts 
having reached their height and cast their lot. Like tears, they fall to the ground. And I go in to the forest to be found. Thank you all. You were a great audience. <laughs> you endured. So, what can I tell you, if anything? You might just be, you've heard enough. <laughs> That's quite something. You had all that to remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, get lo I got lost a couple of times. But. Yeah. So, do you uh, use the fiber from your mama? We, we do. We don't do it that much anymore just because, once again, life got so busy. I got laid off at the paper mill a few years ago. And I'd like to tell you, I'd been smart enough with all of my money. I could have just walked away and retired and, you know, and done stories and poetry full time. But that's not the case. I retrained. I went to college, retrained. I'm working in a hospital now. And that was been, been a huge financial disruption. And my wife got at, outsourced. So we've just been scrambling, to be quite honest. So it, doing your own fiber, and we have done it right from, you might say, sheep to shawl. Uh, she knits and crochets fabulously. I do spin, and I got quite good at spinning, but it's really time-consuming. It's very time-consuming. You can take the fiber and have it processed, but you pay so much for it at these mini mills that honestly, you're better off just going to the yarn shop and picking some really nice fiber out from Peru at a, a half the cost, you know, that you would have to, to, to make your own. In America, we never built a big herd. We used to have a, 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 a woolen mill over in, uh, I think it was Monmouth, not far from where I live. But they closed down right when, you know, we were getting our herd built up and stuff. And so that would have been a really wonderful thing to be able to take your fiber and sell it to a mill that then processed it and, and you had an outlet for your goods. That would have been good for the whole animal business of, of alpacas and llamas. There's a number of reasons it failed. The, the crash in 2008 put the last nail in the coffin, but it was in trouble before that. The people who first imported llamas, they just jacked the price because they, they had a captive audience for people who wanted exotic fibers and exotic animals. Price was just out of sight. Same thing happened with alpacas. They came in after that. And they hyped it up. And when they had their nice big herds of really nice breeding stock, they talked Congress into slamming the door on, Central, on, on uh, South America importing anymore because they, want, they knew that those people down there, they got a couple of three million of them. They can sell you really nice animals every day of the week for a fraction of, put them on the boat and still sell them for less than the people here were charging for them. They didn't want that to happen. So they made a rule. That rule is a typical capitalist rule. He who gets there with the most first wins, and he closes the door behind it. You know, that's what happened. That killed the industry. First off, the gene pool was too small. And in the short time Americans have been doing it, they already started running into too much genetic repetition. So that killed it, and they drove the price so high, it was really just, they were really just scamming people to get into it. We got in late. We actually bought it from people who were just getting out in some ways, you know. My wife loved the animals. I wanted her to be happy. We had these 10 acres, so I bought, we bought them, you know, and we got them a really good price at that time. But there was only a couple of years there where you could just shear it right off and sell the fiber and get a good price for it, you know. Once you have to start processing it, you either have, it's a full-time job during, and it's seasonal. So you have to have something else to do the rest of the year. Unless you just have such a huge herd, you can spend all year processing your own stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of issues there. It would have helped if they would have left that door open and we got a, a, a couple of million or a few hundred thousand at least animals and had a good mill here in America. That's the real issue. It's like so many things. You can have all the trees in the world, but somebody's got to turn them into a two by four, you know? Otherwise, you're not going to make a living off of it unless 
we take a lesson from the Europeans who destroyed a lot of things and then had to learn how to figure it out. That's why I tell that story about Wandstuhl. They Everything we've ever busted here in America, they busted it in Europe first. But because, and if it hadn't have been for discovery of the new world, they would have starved to death and died of pestilence by the droves over there, like, like the Irish did. Those were man-made disasters for the most part. When the Irish were dying because of the, the potato famine, they were exporting wheat and corn to England. You know, most people don't know that. Purely a man-made disaster. But the Irish couldn't afford to eat the wheat and corn. It was grown on the big estates owned by the English. So it was just an empire act is all it was, literally an empire act. They made a law, you guys can't, you have to export this stuff because we can make whiskey out of that, you know, and we can make our own bread with it. So not going to happen for you guys. Off to America they come. But that happened, Europe, Europe dumped, you know, give me your poor and your d downtrodden. That was it. That's what Europe was giving us. But Europeans, there's always been pockets where they sustain, sustainably farmed for a thousand years. That village I was in is one of them. I've been through villages in Germany, one of them on July 4th when we were having our bicentennial. I spoke German, so even though they knew I was an American because I was usually with Americans, taking them around, showing them things, we drove into a village for lunch. I don't even remember the name. It wasn't a tourist place. It was just a little village along the way because I would take people on the by roads. That village had a little restaurant and the steps, pure stone steps like this, they were just hollowed out like that. That's how old that house was. But all of the houses in that village were that old. While we were celebrating our 200th birthday, they were celebrating that very day. Because I asked him, what's all the decorations about? He said, ah, we're celebrating like you Americans, he said in German, you know. This is our 800th birthday for the village, you know. The castle up on the hill that was in ruins, it was older than that, you know. That was from the previous feudal lord, you know. This is what was left, you know. Those people, they couldn't get out. There was no place to go. They had to learn, and they have plowed the same lands over and over again for hundreds of years before we had one drop of fertilizer from oil or natural gas. They did it, and they still know how to do it. Some of them, many of them I, I've read about, unfortunately, have given over to the green, what we call the green revolution, which is high fertilizer, hybrid seeds, Roundup and all that. Well, it's totally destroyed their food. All the food tastes like, like Burger King now. What was beautiful, when I was in Germany, I was there in 64 and I was there in 74 to 79. I was there again as a young man. What was beautiful about Europe is every village you came to, you walk into a little pub, they had one beer because they had a local brewery either there or the next town over. They, you, didn't, you didn't order, you didn't look at a selection, you ordered a beer. Whatever was in season for beer, that's what you drank. They had a meal that they were serving for lunch. There was no menu. If it was goulash or if it was this, and you could have all the bread and cheese you wanted with it, all of that local too, those little wheat fields, they ground it and made bread. Everything tasted, everything had the terroir. The French are fanatics about it with their wines and their cheeses and they should be you know they they fight trade battles all over the world where people copy them and put labels on it and say it's you know this or that you know the Italians are that way too because all these little valleys and everything they taste a certain way but once you start bringing in the the other seeds that aren't that didn't grow up there for the last 2,000 years and the fertilizer nothing but you can make more, per pound, make more pounds, make more money. And so some of the bigger farmers have definitely given in. You know, it's a tragedy. I can remember walking, hiking. I hike every year in Switzerland right up to, because there's eternal glaciers. I don't know if there still are up in, up in the Alps. We would hike right up to the glaciers almost. There's big fields up there in the Alpine fields. And they move their, their, their milk herds up 
in the summertime. The, it's all the old people. The young people don't like, just like here, nobody wants anything to do with it. Old people that have been walking up and down those mountains. And when you get up there, there'll be a little rock face of a, looks like a, looks like a root cellar with a wooden door on it. And in there, or sitting out front when you walk by, will be two people. They're older than the people that are making the trip up and down. The people making the trip up and down are my age. They're up there cutting hay and hauling it down in a wagon with a horse to the barn for the winter. Because you can't go up there in the winter and there's no hay to get in the winter. But that is the best grass you've ever seen. And in that little so-called root cellar, there's a back room to it. Those are, that's Oma and Opa, that's Grandma and Grandpa, this guy walking up, or his parents, okay? He's going up there haying. They're milking the cows, those old people. And guess what they're doing with it? They're making cheese with it. Because they got no refrigeration. They're making cheese with it. And if you go up and pull a couple of Deutschmarks out of your pocket, you can have all the fresh milk you want, and it's all cold because the back side of that root cellar is about like 35 or 40 degrees. They got that cold milk that they're going to make later that day in the cheese. And that stuff, it tastes like it has sugar in it, you know? It's unbelievable. And then you, you get that, and you get, some, you get some cheese that's not aged or whatever from them, and you got your loaf of bread you bought down below, and you're off on your merry way. And the weather is so good up there. If it's not raining, all you need is a sleeping bag. You can just plop down in those, that deep, soft grass and just sleep. And there's nothing above you but the stars and the glaciers and stuff. I'm telling you, if we wanted to transform Maine, I tell this to everybody, anyone who will listen. If we wanted to transform, and they have trails. They have, first off, they have collective land. All the villages are surrounded by old growth forest intermingled with nurseries and adolescents, but they keep their old standards. Big honking trees like this, old, and the sides of the roads are lined with them and these trails up through the forest. It's just, it's just, you've never seen anything like it. You have to go to Yellowstone or the Redwoods and stuff to see anything like it. These people have been living with it their whole life. And you know, I can't help because I, I, I could speak the language quite well then. None of those people were in a hurry. They lived up there all summer. They didn't even have a phone, you know. They'd have, a lot of them were religious. They'd have their Bible and each other. They were as happy as could be. And they worked every day. They didn't even know what the word retirement meant. They had no idea. Nor did they care that they didn't know, you know? It was unbelievable. Those villages, when I was there in 74 to 79, there, there was still, uh, Germany is very industrialized. But one thing they've managed to do, and they protect it zealously, their guilds and their unions are strong. They protect their villages and stuff. They have public transportation to them. I mean, in Hebrew, and I live, I live 17 miles from the hospital. I couldn't catch a bus or get a taxi to save my life. If I, I'd have to call an ambulance to save my life. I gotta drive my own vehicle and if my wife's got a job, she's gotta drive her own because it's a different place or different hours or whatever, you know? I lived in Germany for eight years. I never owned a car. When I wanted to go skiing or hiking in the Alps, I would walk out the front, jump on a street car, go to the train station, get in there throw my bicycle in there if it was summertime, you know, kick back and go to sleep or read a book. I would wake up in Switzerland. If it was skiing season, I would literally step out of the train station. And now some of those places, the bus service isn't regular. I would walk out front and, and look at the first, what they call Lostkraftwagen, just a, a, a delivery truck. And I would just sh -sh -sh, like that. That guy would pull over and I would say, beer's on me. I would get in and he'd drive me to the ski slope if he was, I knew he was going that way because there's only one road between them steep mountains. He's, he's going my way. You know, however far he's going, I'll buy him beer lunch at the next, when he stops for lunch. I would be there 
it would cost me next to nothing. It, it wasn't worth owning a car. You could get around Europe all day long and never own a car. It, one of the most expensive, damaging things we do as Americans, we figured out the most expensive, inconvenient way to stand in line in our automobiles. Out here it ain't too bad. But you go to a city bigger than Portland, which I'm assuming all of you have been, you're going to stand in line. And you're going to do it twice a day if you want to make a living. You know, that's the rule. And so we, we got to have some new thinking in this country. Everybody who's thinking the old way is fundamentally wrong. But we're all invested in that. So those, they, get, they, they have the biggest audience. But they're fundamentally wrong. It will not work. This little book I'm selling here, the name of it is Confession to a Grandchild. It used to be called, when I was a few years younger and more edgy, it used to be called Your Grandchildren Will Hate You, you know? But that one still may be true. I, I tutor in college two, three times a week, young people. If we think that this system that's collapsing around their ears, trillions of dollars of debt just to get uh, an education that may not get them a job, if they think they're, they're going to continue to pay for the system we've erected, you know, on borrowed money with no hope of sustainability, and they're not going to get disgruntled about it, we better think again. I think that we're going to find out that our grandchildren will be the ones saying, I'm not doing it anymore. You know? And if you talk to your college-age <laughs> grandkids and ask them to be honest with you, I bet you they'll tell you that. Oh, no, we're not going to do that much longer. You know? We have to have a fundamental rearrangement of resources and allocation and most of all, a meaningful life every day. We don't have that either. Go ahead. It has to be a fundamental shift of values. Because Absol values Absolutely. Until we, get that. until we get that. And, and, and I agree with you 100%. That's why nothing in here. Some people, oh, when did you write that thing? I said, years ago. They thought I wrote it against Trump or somebody. <laughs> Trump is not a leader, he's a follower. He's the end result of our failed policies, you know? That's all he is. I, I'll say that to anybody, anyone who loves him or anyone who hates him. He's not a leader. He's just the end result of a bunch of failed policies. Yeah, well, and some of them intended. Some of them are intended, but they're failures. You know, and we're, we're a society that loves celebrities. And even the so-called good ones, I'm not against them personally. I'm against no one personally, not Trump. But I'm against the principles and the values that they use. Um, the Oracle of Omaha guy, what's his name? Uh, or Bill Gates or, you know, these guys, they're huge philanthropists. They give billions of dollars. It's hard to throw rocks at them. And I don't for that. But they all made their billions in a system where crushing the competition is the way you get there, you know. Um, Warren Buffett. Now Warren Buffett, he says, what he does, he, and these, these are his words, not mine. We look for industries and businesses that have a moat around them, he says. Now think about that, a moat around it. And we steadily try to make the moat wider and deeper. So whether he gets into oil or data, you know, or commodities or whatever, he tries to sew up the mark and then make the moat deeper so that no one else can penetrate that. Okay? That, and and he's, he's wildly, you know, he's like got like a hundred mil billion dollars or something, you know? Great for him. Woo-hoo. But you know what? Even if he gives away half of it or 90% of it, he got there by reinforcing the success and making that the goal for all of our business majors in the, in the whole world. I want to be like him. So the system that we get our success by is more powerful than any individual success, however large it is. We reinforce the system. 
You're right. We have to fundamentally change the values and the system. It, it isn't. If I've spent the last three years studying anatomy and physiology for the medical industry that I work in. If we treated the cells and the systems of our body the way that we treat each other, we would be overcome with heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Oh, but wait. We are. As a nation, we are. To think that we can do this outwardly, Americans have this idea that what I do out here doesn't affect this, you know. That, uh, nothing, everything is connected. Anyone who studies science quickly realize it's all connected. You cannot treat your lungs without affecting your heart. You know? There's a movement called conservation medicine. Yeah. With animal health, human health, and yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah, it, 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 absolutely. We cannot get away from it. We have thought we could dump whatever we could. You know, our, our, what do they call them? Our EPA laws are really have one simple premise. How much can I poop on you and in your drinking water before you can win a lawsuit against me? That's it. That's where we're at. You know, and the people there now want to weaken that so it's harder. They want to raise that threshold before you, that we can successfully sue them for pooping in our water and our children's water. I think the rule ought to be anything you build or make, your children have to move in downstream from it, immediately downstream, go to school there and eat and drink it. And then if you're good with that, I'm good with it. But your children and your grandchildren first. We do that, then we'll get a discussion going, you know. So, I know I sound militant. My, my principles in here are very easy. You know, the love of never enough, we've got that down pat, you know. I like the one in, in the poem I recited you, uh, the abundance of just enough. If you think about your bodily systems, the heart circulates all the nutrients, all the oxygen, and it, it's also the trash collector. It collects all the waste and delivers them where they want to go. Everybody has free access to everything they need. Everybody can take exactly what they need. Now everybody does a job in there too to provide their part to the health of the body. Our, our diseases in America, over 70% are chronic preventable diseases. And guess what? Most of them are related to, and I'm using a metaphor here, a particular cell saying, I'm just going to keep taking and taking and taking. Diabetes, out of control blood sugar, right? The inability to even absorb it anymore, I'm just worn out. You know, my pancreas just can't keep up, you know. Cancer, unlimited growth, you know. It just goes on and on. Clogged arteries, it's just too much stuff in the way. You know, and I want to put more there. Give me another cheeseburger. You know, it, it's just, it's an insanity. As I said, everyone, you're all old enough. Everyone in my generation is insane. <laughs> you got time for one more or no? I want you to talk about your book. My books are for sale. The little ones are 25. I wish I could charge $5 for them, but as you can see, they're handmade with leather and fabric and hard. I make them and sew them and print them. The little ones is like the complete works. And I like it because it, this, is, this is a book, you, you don't read this book start to finish, you know. It's like the stories I just told. You read it, you think about it. You share it with the person you're having lunch with. You know, you, this is the one you stick in your coat pocket or your purse and stuff. These here, these are individual poems, some of them from right from there. But these are journals. And those poems, those stories, they just serve as a hopping off point for your thoughts. Okay? That's what they are. And then this, this here is the one thing I want to leave you with. It takes me five minutes if you'll let me do it. That's this. I charge $5 for it just because it's 
really great 100% cotton paper. And this one, you either keep it or you give it to somebody you think because it's like having this conversation. And this, this is in honor of people like you who show up to have the conversation and show up to listen and, and provide the venue for those of us who want to have something to say, hopefully that's meaningful and not just narcissistic. Dear Madam or Sir, beloved friends, fellow conspirators, this is how we will begin when we return to letters. The announcements will continue online this or that event at seven on such and such a day, etc., etc. But the substance, the substance will be written with pen in hand to capture and prolong the moment. In the beginning, the movement will resemble an underground society whose members are poets, a subspecies of the human race given to scribblings on napkins and wanderings of the mind. Communiques enclosed in envelopes, shielded from the prying eyes of the surveillance state, will, upon receipt, be opened with care. We bask in the greeting, taking note of the labor and style of your penmanship. Pondering every phrase, we imagine your face and the tone of your voice, becoming like children on their mother's lap at bread time. Read, read it again, and having hung on your word, we sleep. Your character appears in our dreams and your metaphor, however far-fetched from the distant land of what could be, if only, will come to us in the doldrum moments of days to come when our minds slip briefly free from the trenches of absurdity, where we hunker beneath an endless barrage of data the shrapnel of marketing, the mustard gas of must-have, choking and disfiguring, forcing us to wear masks that make us all look alike and peer through narrow lenses, constricting our vision, blinding us to any other possibility. Our feet mired in the mud of need and necessity, making it all but impossible to flee. In these stolen moments, before the bugle sounds the next charge, a patriotic hymn to protect the tyrant of never enough who lives far from the front in the lap of luxury and drives us to launch an assault across a no man's land, blasphemed with the broken barricades and barbed wire of nationalism, the scorched earth of global free trade, a landscape of apocalypse now and more to come, littered with unemployment and refugees, the corpses of the landless, obsolete, posted and verboten, the very obsolescence of land for the living. In this pause, pilfered, when the chain of command is inattentive, I take your letter from the pocket over my heart and read the first verse, sotto voce. Pausing, I pass it to a fellow conscript on my left or right, and they utter your words like a creed, an affirmation of life rising up from the grave, kindling hope that the flame of sanity still burns in another. Therefore, please, however infrequent, write me, us, a letter. Our tears will stain the parchment, the ink running like your logic through our minds with the force of flu in the trenches, wasting the will to struggle in vain for doctrines decreed by degenerates. When the emesis of anger and the fever of frustration break, leaving us weak and exhausted, but immune by reason of coming to our senses, we too will abandon this war of attrition, deserters returning to a home none remember, our feet harrowing the ground beneath us, letting it rest and lie fallow, 
were absent the bombardment of busyness and the strafing staccato of commerce, it regains fertility, weedy ideas germinating in the silence. Thank you. Thank you. Libraries, we got to have them, I'm telling you. If we ever get rid of the libraries and the post office, which a lot of people would do, we're all done. We are all done. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much.